the guidance from this community on how to move forward. From now until the end of all the effort and, 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 and sleepless night that we were to support people, whether at country level, regional level, global level, is to ensure that people have the freedom of a choice. They have the freedom of choice to stay, to move, and to, have, to be supported where, where they are on the move. Hello, everybody. I'm excited to welcome you to a new episode of the, of the podcast series Talking Migration. This podcast series is a space to reflect uh, on global trends of migration and to share initiatives from IOM and partners. This is a collaboration between the UN Migration Agency, IOM, uh, Climate Action Division and Innovation Knowledge Management Unit, and the Adaptation Division of the UN Climate Change Secretariat, UNFCCC. As we're gearing up to the 29th Conference of Party, COP29, just around the corner in Baku, Azerbaijan, I'm very pleased to be here today and to welcome and introduce to you our speakers. Um, we are here with our director of the Climate Action Division in IOM, Rania Shraj, and also with our esteemed guest, Yusuf Nasef, the director of the Adaptation Division at the UNFCCC. So thank you very much for being with us today. And now let's dive into what is a, I'm, it's promised to be a very thought-provoking discussion. But just to set the scene of our conversation, we know that from Pacific Islands to Sub-Saharan Africa, millions are on the move due, due to climate impacts. And these millions of people are actually women, girls, children, people with disability, elderly, with differentiated needs, priorities, and capabilities to cope with this very difficult situation. And as countries negotiate and implement uh, the Paris Agreement to curb uh, global warming, it's crucial that the international community step up and support migrants facing these challenges. Um, we also have to recognize that in this past decade, uh, we have made significant strides. Migration are now firmly embedded in climate negotiations. The new Global Climate Fund, uh, the fund to respond to loss and damage, even includes provision to help uh, those displaced by climate change. But there is a key uh, question that really need to be tackled and addressed more. How can migration leverage, uh, how can migration be leveraged to boost climate adaptation? Three weeks away from COP29, this is uh, the annual global negotiation forum on climate change, bring it together the most of the country of the world. Let's discuss what solutions are possible together. So I'm very pleased uh, to have you both here today. And uh, thank you very much for accepting to be here. And let's start maybe with uh, Yusuf. Let's start with you. And we would love to hear about uh, what are the priorities for the UNFCCC in the next COP29, and specifically for the Adaptation Division. And what challenges are we facing in advancing migration uh, agenda within the adaptation track? We also know that there is a finance gap and we would like you to talk a little bit about that and how migration can be leveraged for transformational adaptation. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's quite a pleasure and, and I'm, I'm very happy to note that um, um, as an organization, UNFCC has been quite um, engaged with IOM on all aspects relating to migration over the past period, but especially in the past few months, this relationship has uh, intensified considerably. And we really need the guidance from this community on how to move forward. And let me tell you why. Now, for many people, the negotiations on climate change look like a black box. It's a very complicated issue. Um, infinite numbers of acronyms that are very difficult to surmount if you're not an insider. It, it's, it's, it's a pretty confusing environment. Um, now, there is no agenda item on migration in the negotiations because people typically um, look at sectors and hazards. So um, in the sort of the first level uh, of organization of our discussions, we look at things like food, water, health, uh, coastal zones, ecosystems. Maybe we look at hazards, floods, droughts, uh, hurricanes, slow onset events. Mm -hmm. And migration is an aspect that is cross-cutting across all of these. Um, but it's also 
potentially a solution and potentially a problem. Mm-hmm. And, and that makes it um, very difficult for people who are there from the sectors or from uh, the political sphere to fully appreciate the complexity, the multidisciplinarity, intersectionality of, of migration. Um, and, and that's the, the, the biggest challenge that I see in trying to adopt migration as a priority in, in the system. So we do have something called the Task Force um, on Displace- Displacement within um, the work stream on loss and damage. This is doing very good work providing recommendations um, for the COP. But this year in particular, I think there's quite a few opportunities to advance the discourse on migration within the climate change context. Why? Because in COP29, there are mandates for revising, reviewing and revising a number of existing um, work programs and looking at the progress that has happened over the past decade or two and giving new and renewed and re-energized mandates for the future. And this is quite ripe for input from external stakeholders, from um, people who are applying foresight to see, okay, where do we need to go from here? How have we done in the past and how can we do better? And I know that IOM has provided two submissions this year on just transition, for example. So one of the elements that we will be looking at is advancing the work program on just transition, which is also another black box in our system. No one knows exactly where it will go. Mm -hmm. It's imperative that when you move from point A to point B, you make sure that that transition does not result Mm -hmm. in new vulnerabilities or in creating um, Mm -hmm. um, um, new um, levels of poverty as a result. And so this is becoming a really big um, area for, for discussion. And I think the migration component in that will be really important. So I'm glad that there have been these submissions. And it's really important to make sure um, that the delegates that are involved in the negotiations have this as front of mind. That's one area. And and I mention it first because it's still in the design process. It does not have uh, momentum yet that you cannot change, but it is ripe for Mm -hmm. giving direction to. Another area where um, the the COP will will, um, create a revised context is that of national adaptation plans. There's a mandate for revising, um, for assessing progress in, in, in the NAPS and looking at how to do things differently. And there is obviously a a supplement being um, prepared with with very good inputs from IOM. It's now in the process of of final design. And that gives guidance to countries on how to make sure that migration-related aspects are fully integrated in national adaptation planning. This is really important because national adaptation plans are the core instrument for Um, adaptation action and support. There's a mandate for supporting both the formulation of national adaptation plans and the implementation of all the projects and programs therein. So that's another area where it will be important to integrate migration into that story, which was not the case when they were first um, discussed. Finally, I'd like to mention the loss and damage context which really spawned that um, task force for mm-hmm. displacement, which is uh, sort of our, our core work stream for the work on migration. And now this work stream has matured to an extent that it has a dedicated body for um, technical support called the Santiago Network and a dedicated fund, mm-hmm. which was capitalized very rapidly at the end, at the beginning of the last COP session. And, um, and that fund for responding to loss and damage um, will also need input. It's still under design, so the architecture has been largely mm-hmm. figured out, but the scope, the vision, what will be eligible, what will not be, will need that type of input from uh, organizations that know what they're doing on the aspect mm-hmm. of migration and displacement. Here's where we really need uh, guidance from organizations like like IOM. So those, I, th- I think, are, um, are, are big... Um, entry points to make sure that the future is not just a a linear repetition of the past, but that we can create Mm -hmm. a new paradigm there that gives migration its rightful place. You mentioned funding as well, and there's something what we call the NCQG for short, the the new uh, climate collective quantitative goal. In the past, there was a a goal set at $100 billion a year, and now we're mandated to go upwards of that. Some people are talking in the range of uh, of a trillion, but we will see there'll be layers in there possibly. Um, And and somehow um, the estimate of how much of this can go into 
avoiding uh, forced displacement or helping um, use displacement as a solution, as adaptation, and ensuring that it doesn't evolve into maladaptation um, will be an important aspect of the discussions on finance. So, um, like I say, COP29 is, is a turning point in, uh, or in potentially in engaging all the elements that are also of, uh, of priority to IOM in the work of the UNFCC as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Yusef. And indeed, uh, I truly believe that COP29, it, it's really a turning point uh, to better integrate migration in these different areas of work, like just transition, but also the NAPS, uh, the National Adaptation Plan, the loss and damage, and many other areas is extremely crucial uh, for us and for migrant and displaced communities. Now, let's turn to Rania. Thank you so much, Rania, for being with us. Um, now, as IOM, we live by uh, one motto, think of tomorrow, but act today. So what are the key entry points for migration discussion at COP29? What can IOM do at COP to support these crucial talks? Uh, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you, Yusuf, for being today with us. I think it's very hard to mention anything after Yusuf's intervention. Uh, but let me tell you that the discussion around migration is not starting only in COP29. It is started by a lot of collective effort led by IOM, supported by UNFCCC effort to ensure from COP27 human mobility, migration, displacement is part of the discussion. We have different opportunities. I'm very glad that today I see more and more awareness among com governments, communities, academia and science, uh, uh, other UN agencies. We all speak the same language when it comes to the needs of integrating migrant voices, displaced community voices into key decisions. We have different um, uh, uh, startup points. Um, I'm so glad to say that uh, until April this year, there was almost 53 national adaptation plans integrated climate mobility, human mobility into their uh, language. Some of it only with reference and others with actions. But I'm also so happy that this year we launched the national, the technical guide for integrating human mobility and climate change into national planning processes. It's an amazing opportunity that for all of us, different, different UN agencies, IOM, to support member states in ensuring that human mobility is well integrated and tackled into the national adaptation uh, plans. I also would like to say that despite that the global uh, adaptation goals last year didn't explicitly mention migration, but actually in different targets, in different discussions, like on food security, water, health, livelihood, there was a clear discussion around the voice and the support that need to be given to minimize the bad and, and, and the negative impact of climate change into uh, increasing displacement. What IOM is, is going to do, IOM is acting now, as you mentioned, but it's not acting today. We've been acting since years. What we are doing now that we are not only acting at policy level with the support and coordination and partnership with UNFCCC, with member states, with other UN agencies, with communities, with governments, but also we are uh, um, doing an operational different kind of programs and, and projects that has been led by our different country offices everywhere. So we are going to COP29 to continue raising our voice to the migration needs. We're going to COP29 we're bringing with us 24 young people who's been displaced, affected by, my, by, by displacement and by climate crisis to come and tell a story of how the negative impact of climate change they've been able to transform to force of power to support their communities and support their people. So we're going with our experience from the field of successful, uh, scalable solutions. We're bringing with us the voice through the youth voices, but also we're going to support the policy discussion, policy maker with advocating for people. Our three core things is and our three core ask is to ensure that early warning, early action, disaster risk reduction is, is there when it comes to policy discussion, but also implementation of different uh, breakthrough and different programs on the ground to support the people, to have a resilient, scalable and sustainable solution. For, but also 
For people who have to move due to climate crisis, we are focusing on supporting regular pathways and ensuring that displacement migration could be a solution rather than a burden. And last but not least, alone, we cannot do much, but together we can do a lot. So IOM is bringing the academia and science, mm -hmm. private sector, to sit together with the communities and government to ensure that we come with innovative solutions that help people to actually adapt and be supported within the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rania. And it's so important, this convening role and bringing together different type of expertise and also especially the voice of youth and people affected by displacement and acting, as you said, at both at the policy level, but also with very hands on and operational initiative. Now, you spoke about the technical guide that we developed in jointly with UNFCCC. So I wanted to ask Yusuf maybe to dive a little bit more deeper into the guide, because this guide is meant to support uh, the mainstreaming integration of human mobility into national climate planning, but also focusing on the national um, adaptation plan. How can you? How do you see this guide really helping state rethink uh, the vital link between migration and climate adaptation? Thank you. That's a very good question. I think um, just just to recap on the the NAP process. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it sort of followed up on an older process called the NAPAS, National Adaptation Programs of Action, which were mainly concerned with urgent and immediate needs. So the NAPS came and they started looking at medium and long term needs. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is looking ahead, looking into the future, mm -hmm. um, think of tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, but act uh, continuously today, tomorrow and yesterday mm -hmm. as well. Um, and and um, I think the important thing here that um, that this particular guide, which, which um, is one of several um, thematic um, supplements that have been done for the adaptation planning process, uh, the important thing that it can add is, um, number one, engaging the right um, stakeholders in the country. So it's not just the existing ministries, you know, bringing um, each of them, bringing one of their representatives and that's it, but actually realizing that there are some themes that may not be obvious and may not be obviously represented in how um, they are preparing their prioritization of actions for national adaptation plans. And so this is one thing, and I think the guide presents that whole notion of holism and um, multi-stakeholder um, engagement. Second is the difficult task of looking ahead, because we that's why I started by saying we're looking at medium and long term um, impacts. Countries may have plans for, you know, food security in 2050, water security, etc. But what does all this mean in terms of migration? What's our long term vision there? What's the determinant of success in 2030 or beyond? Because the plans have to look forward to that. Are there any implications of frontier technologies, you know, drones, AI, big data, etc. And and this type of thinking, I think, in the context of displacement, migration, etc., will be helped um, by the um, the enhanced understanding that will come from the addition of the elements from this guide to the adaptation planning process. Third is actually opening the door for additional financial resources to flow because the finance that is provided through the financial mechanism of uh, the climate change process will largely be responsive to the country prioritization as reflected in the NAPS and there's comparability across all countries on how what steps they are following to reach um, this rigorous assessment of what is important and what is not and once migration has its rightful place in that priority list and actions have been um, uh, given thought and have been very well articulated, trans transferred to project profiles and then project proposals. This will, I think, open the door to another layer of finance to come into supporting countries in preemptively dealing with the different impacts of climate change that could potentially lead to undesirable forced displacement or having plans for orderly displacement that could itself become an adaptation measure, but done in dignity and with all rights uh, preserved and with um, a good plan for 
perhaps returning people back to um, their um, their homes once the disaster subsides or having um, uh, appropriate arrangements for permanent relocation if wherever they, they came from is becoming uninhabitable due to climate change. So I think um, in the end, the NAP process and the guide will help us reach an elevated level of understanding and assessment and planning and action on the full integration of, of migration in our work on climate change, which is gradually becoming sort of the central theme for, for much of the international community's concerns nowadays. Thank you so much, Joseph. And I think it's so important, this multi-stakeholder engagement and the fact that it's so crucial to involve the right stakeholder, which might be not the usual one, but also more voices also coming from youth community and being very much at the center of the whole the process. Uh, now, getting back to Rania, you've spoken before about innovation, uh, which is very interesting to us. And we know you just launched uh, the Climate Mobility Innovation Lab, so congratulations for that. How can these labs drive innovative solutions to support countries in addressing migration and climate adaptation. Um, let's hear about the impact that you are foreseeing for the Climate Mobility Innovation Labs. Thank you, Laura. And let me start by, by uh, actually addressing a point that I was discussing with Yusuf yesterday when he told me, what's IOM ambitious to see when it comes to uh, climate migration and, and, and displacement of the people? And I told him that what we want to see from now until the end of all the effort and, 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 and sleepless night that we were to support people, whether at country level, regional level, global level, is to ensure that people have the freedom of a choice. They have the freedom of choice to stay, to move, and to, have, to be supported where, where they are on the move. And basically, the Climate Mobility Innovation Lab came as part of uh, the discussion to ensure that some of the people can have a resilient solution to allow them to stay. But they don't have the know-how. They don't have the global knowledge, the global science, because we've been, as, 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 as a sector, we've been always reactive to a certain... There is a flooding here, so let's go uh, and act upon. There is a, a, a water scarcity here, let's go and act upon. The idea of the lab is to actually bring together a whole of a society approach, but also understand that there is no one solution fit for all. The labs will be at the regional level, and the idea is to contextualize and to actually uh, bring into making a solution the communities. So bring the community, bring the global knowledge through the science and academia, bring the private sector with the technology to sit with the government, with the young people, with the women affected, and come with scalable, innovative solution. The lab will not only be a think tank, but it will test the solution. Once the solution is proven to be successful, we will work together collectively with the government of this country to mainstream this solution, to help them supporting technically. We bring together the whole of society. We bring together other agencies to work to ensure that we have sustainable, scalable solution and leave this country in three, five years with a solution to climate crisis. But also we found that different communities have amazing ideas. So the lab will be an, an opportunity to have a community of practices from young people, from women, from climate activists, where we are creating a social media platform, where we listen and learn from them, but also they gain from the different climate research, from the different successful opportunities that can uh, uh, support them within their community, raise their awareness and build their capacities. And the last thing, We've been talking about advocacy, influencing policymakers. I think policymakers want to see successful actions where we can create a policies on climate finance, on climate adaptation, on just transition, etc. With tested solution that we can say this worked, let's create a policy. Let's ensure there is finance that support this kind of scalable solution. So the lab is in started started by two regions. It's going to be expanded to different regions. And the idea is a bottom-top approach. So we're bringing the global knowledge to the hand of 
the communities to allow sustainable, scalable solutions. So it's not just innovation. It is the testing and the scalability that can leave a country and community resilient and adapted to the climate crisis. Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm sure we're going to collaborate a lot on the Climate Mobility Innovation Lab as Innovation and Knowledge Management Unit as well. And it's so important, this aspect of co-creation, co-developing with different partners, stakeholders, bringing together different type of expertise and really testing the approach, as you said, having the proof of concept that we then bring the solution at scale. Um, and I also very much like the idea of the community of practice connecting knowledge between different practitioners, academia, private sectors, governments and other. So thank you for so much for this inspiring conversation. We are go- going to lighten things up a little bit because we have uh, the last segment of our podcast is a bit more on a personal touch. It's the rapid fire question. These are more questions on to know you in, on a personal note. Uh, so it's meant to be very quick. So the first question uh, may be for you, Youssef. Mm. Would, do you prefer music festival or art galleries? Music festival. Music festival. Oh. I'm Egyptian. Of course, we love music. <laughs> um, now, this is. I love this question. If you were, if you weren't in your current career, what you will be doing? You mm, I would probably be a farmer, but not a normal one, using regenerative practices, so totally sustainable, <laughs> totally organic, etc. Agroecology. That's mm-hmm. great. What about you, Rania? Uh, leading my restaurant by the sea. And this is my even <laughs> retirement dream. <laughs> That's fantastic. You can even work together in a partnership. Exactly. Get the buyer. We have the provider <laughs> and we have exactly. then the and local restaurant. And I can also restaurant. provide the client. You know, <laughs> exactly. I, I like to eat. <laughs> we have a, a solution, like full cycle here. Perfect. Now, Yusuf, in one word, what word would you would use to describe your career journey? Hmm... Um, happily uphill, <laughs> so always meeting challenges, but with with a lot of positivity and and uh, and um, enthusiasm and optimism. That's great. This is really the type of leadership that we need. What about you, Rania? Uh, I had I had a, a, a leader boss that I she she actually inspired me maybe 20 years ago. And she used to tell me, you are determined. So I can say that I've been always have a lot of determination uh, to to ensure we achieve results and face in the cause we are fighting for. So I can say determined face uh, for, for the people we're serving. Thank you so much. I really would like to thank you both for being here with us for this very inspiring and insightful conversation. And to our listen, please uh, share these episodes or, or like it. If you want to know more about innovation and knowledge management, we also have a website, iom.int slash innovation or iom.int slash knowledge. At COP29, please help us rally the global community to hear the call, think of tomorrow and act today. And if you want to know more about migration, environment, and climate change, please also visit IOM Environmental Migration Portal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.